The rise and fall of the ZX Spectrum transformed Britain from tea drinkers into bedroom programmers, creating a computer revolution in 1982. This rubber-keyed marvel democratised computing, costing just £125 when competitors demanded thousands. But here's what nobody tells you. Sinclair considered the Spectrum a failure because it wasn't the business computer he'd envisioned. Yet this supposed failure sparked a phenomenon that shaped British technology for generations, turning spotty teenagers into millionaire game developers and council house bedrooms into software studios challenging Silicon Valley. In April 1982, Sir Clive Sinclair unveiled the ZX Spectrum at the Earl's Court Computer Fair in London. This small black box would democratise computing in ways that still resonate today. At £125 for the 16K model and £175 for the 48K version, Sinclair had achieved the impossible, a proper colour computer that cost less than a decent television set. The economics were staggering. The BBC Micro cost £399, the Commodore 64 would retail around £350, and the Apple II exceeded £1,000. Sinclair had weaponized economies of scale to create what he called computing for the millions, not the millionaires. Here's something rarely discussed. The Spectrum's rubber keyboard wasn't Sinclair's first choice. Internal documents reveal proper plastic keys would have added £15 to the retail price. That cost-cutting decision probably sold a million extra units, making computing accessible to families who could never have afforded it otherwise. Designer Rick Dickinson spent weeks trying to improve the rubber keyboard's feel, ultimately failing but creating something so distinctive it became part of British identity. Manufacturing was pure chaos. Sinclair Research partnered with Timex in Dundee, creating hundreds of jobs in an area devastated by industrial decline. Workers who'd never seen computers were suddenly assembling the future. Quality control was variable. Early units had a 30% failure rate leading to the infamous Sinclair shrug, where broken spectrums were replaced rather than repaired because it was cheaper. But here's the controversial bit Sinclair kept quiet. The Spectrum was never meant for games. He genuinely believed he was creating a serious business tool for computer literacy. He was reportedly furious when users played Manic Miner instead of learning basic programming. This tension between vision and reality would contribute to his downfall, but not before his machine transformed British culture in unpredictable ways. Speaking of distinctive features, stick around because later I'm revealing how the Spectrum's colour system was actually a beautiful accident that nearly destroyed the entire project. And if you're enjoying this trip down memory lane, hit that subscribe button for more untold British tech stories. What happened next was a social revolution. Within months of launch, the Spectrum had infiltrated British homes like no technology before. By Christmas, 1982, there were six-month waiting lists at Dixon's and W.H. Smith. The Spectrum conquered council estates in Glasgow, terraced houses in Manchester and mining villages in Wales. For £125, working-class kids suddenly had the same technology as their wealthy counterparts. By 1984, the Spectrum had sold over 2 million units in the UK, one for every 25 Britons. More importantly, 43% of owners were from households earning less than £10,000 yearly. The computer revolution wasn't happening in private schools, it was exploding in bedrooms above chip shops. Matthew Smith exemplified this perfectly. A 17-year-old from Liverpool taught himself programming and created Manic Miner. Within a year, he'd made enough to buy a house in cash. The Oliver Twins started coding in Somerset and built an empire. David Braben, co-creator of Elite, began programming as a teenager in Hertfordshire. These weren't Silicon Valley entrepreneurs with venture capital. They were British kids with comprehensive school educations and boundless creativity. The Spectrum created a meritocracy where your postcode didn't matter, only your code did. The economic impact was staggering. By 1985, the UK games industry, built on Spectrum development, was worth £100 million annually. Britain became the world's second largest software producer after America, mostly from teenagers' bedrooms. Ocean Software, Ultimate Play the Game and Imagine Software became household names, employing hundreds and generating millions. 
the educational establishment was caught off guard. Schools with expensive BBC micros found their students knew more about programming than teachers, having learned on home spectrums. Universities reported surging computer science applications from working class students who discovered their calling. The government's computer literacy project was essentially redundant. Sinclair achieved more through market forces than the state managed through intervention. The spectrum didn't just bring computers home, it brought possibility and opportunity to millions who would never have accessed it otherwise. This wasn't planned social engineering, but accidental revolution through affordable technology. The Spectrum wasn't just a computer, it was a complete sensory experience. That distinctive smell of warm plastic filled bedrooms like technological incense. The rubber keyboard required a unique typing technique, aggressive massage rather than typing. Every key had multiple functions through caps shift and symbol shift combinations. Want to type load double quote double quote, that's J, then symbol shift plus P twice, then Enter. Veterans could do it blindfolded. But the real Spectrum experience was loading games from cassette. You'd insert your tape into your dedicated recorder, usually a Boots own brand for £9.99 pence, type load weed bass, press play and wait and wait. Those loading sounds, screech, warble, electronic scream, were data converted to audio. The pilot tone's high-pitched whistle, followed by rapid-fire data bursts like R2-D2 having a breakdown. Experienced users could diagnose problems by sound alone. A warble meant adjust the volume. Too much bass? Turn down the tone. The silence between blocks was either relief or mounting dread before R tape loading error 0 colon 1. Loading times were legendary. Manic minor, 4 minutes 30 seconds. Elite, 7 minutes. R type 128K, 11 biblical minutes. Families developed rituals. Tea was made, homework completed, siblings bribed to stay quiet because any vibration could cause failure. Loading screens became art. Bob Wakelin and Drew Northcott created masterpieces that held attention for five minutes while hiding corrupted attributes. Images built line by line, revealing themselves like digital striptease. Ocean screens were so good, people loaded games just to see them. Here's something unknown. The Spectrum's color clash, where colors bled into 8x8 pixel blocks, was a brilliant hack that shouldn't have worked. The hardware could only store two colors per character square, but this cost-cutting limitation forced incredible creativity. Developers invented color cycling and careful sprite design, turning weakness into distinctive aesthetic. After an hour of gaming, your spectrum was warm enough to heat a small room. The power supply could double as a weapon and left burn marks on carpets everywhere. The Interface One's micro drives had failure rates that would trigger modern lawsuits, yet people bought them desperate for faster loading. Before I tell you about those legendary loading sounds, here's something fascinating. There's actually a scientific reason why we sat inches from televisions during loading. Our brains were literally trying to decode patterns in the border stripes. Keep watching for the secret psychology behind those hypnotic loading screens that nobody talks about. Beneath that iconic case with its rainbow stripe lay engineering genius, born from brutal cost-cutting. The Spectrum's heart was a Zilog Z80A processor, running at 3.5 MHz, blazing fast in 1982, roughly equivalent to a modern calculator. The 48K model's memory seems laughable now, but it was enough to store this entire script with room to spare. The 16K model had just 6.5K available after the system grabbed its share, forcing programmers to perform coding miracles. The ULA, Uncommitted Logic Array Chip, was Sinclair's masterstroke, a custom chip handling video, audio and keyboard input that cost £5 to manufacture. Ferranti produced millions, each one essentially a computer on a chip before that was even a concept. This single component did the work of dozens of chips in competitors' machines, explaining the Spectrum's impossibly low price. Here's a secret that made hardware hackers weep. The Edge connector. Those golden fingers at the back connected to everything. The processor, memory, power. One careless insertion of a wobbly peripheral could fry your entire machine. 
Everyone knew someone who'd killed their spectrum with static electricity or a badly seated Kempston joystick interface. The lack of protection was deliberate cost-cutting, saving 50 pence per unit but causing countless tragedies. The modifications people attempted were legendary. Adding composite video output to eliminate dot crawl, installing reset buttons, incredibly the original had none, even retrofitting proper keyboards. Schools had spectrum surgery sessions where kids learned electronics by fixing broken machines. One Manchester teenager famously added 256k of memory using chips dissolded from broken BBC micros, creating a Franken spectrum that shouldn't have existed. The Kempston joystick interface became so standard that games detected it automatically. But here's what's mental. It was completely unlicensed. Kempston simply reverse engineered the edge connector and sold thousands before Sinclair even noticed. The interface to Sinclair's official joystick port was inferior and arrived too late. This Wild West approach to peripherals created an entire cottage industry of bedroom hardware hackers. Sound modification was another obsession. The Spectrum's beeper could only produce one tone at a time, but programmers discovered they could simulate chords through rapid switching. Tim Follin's soundtrack for Agent X used interrupts to create music that seemed impossible. Hardware modders added AY sound chips from the 128K model to original 48K machines, performing delicate surgery with soldering irons in teenage bedrooms. The tape loading system used 1,500 board for data transfer. Revolutionary for 1982. Fun fact you could literally hear programs. Some musicians recorded Spectrum programs onto vinyl. The Shakin' Stevens fan club infamously included a Spectrum game on a flexi-disc that actually loaded. The Thompson Twins hid Spectrum code in their album Quick Step and Sidekick. Play track four backwards at the right speed and it loaded a message. The build quality varied wildly. Early Spectrums from the Dundee factory were solid. Later cost-reduced versions had paper-thin PCBS that cracked if you looked at them wrong. Issue 2 boards are now collector's items because they were built like tanks. Issue 6 boards from 1985 feel like they'd snap if you sneezed. Yet somehow millions still work today. Testament to the Z80's indestructibility. The Spectrum's 24,000 title library wasn't just entertainment, it was cultural phenomenon. Manic Minor, 1983, was revelation. In-game music, smooth animation, 20 perfect levels by one Liverpool teenager. Every Spectrum owner knew Eugene's lair and the processing plant. Its sequel, Jet Set Willy, became legendary partly due to a bug making it impossible to complete without a poke memory modifications that became Spectrum folklore. Elite by David Braben and Ian Bell fitted an entire galaxy into 48K through procedural generation. Players spent months reaching elite status, discussing Thargoid tactics and trade routes between Lave and Zeance. Two Cambridge students had created something more ambitious than anything from America or Japan, but the real community magic happened through magazines. Sinclair user, your Sinclair and Crash were monthly events. Kids rushed to W.H. Smith on publication day. These magazines didn't just review games, they shaped culture. Your Sinclair's humour influenced British comedy. Crash reviews could make or break software houses. Type-in listings deserve special recognition. Every magazine included basic code readers could type to create games. Spending six hours typing code only to find a typo online 340 was a rite of passage, but it taught programming better than formal education. Kids learned variables, loops and subroutines through making pixel-perfect Space Invaders copies. Debugging typos taught problem-solving skills that served throughout careers. Bedroom coders became celebrities. Eugene Evans, the Stamper Brothers, Jeff Minter carried rock star weight in playgrounds. Ultimate play the game, maintain mystique by never giving interviews. When Ultimate's Night Law introduced isometric 3D in 1984, it was Britain's gaming moon landing. The piracy scene created its own subculture. Every school had its supplier with connections to cracked games. C15 cassettes changed hands behind bike sheds, carefully labelled with felt tip. Crack screens with scrolling messages and chiptune music became art forms. 
Protection schemes like Speedlock led to an arms race pushing programming techniques forward. Budget games at £1.99 democratised gaming further. Mastertronic, Firebird and Codemasters proved great games didn't need great budgets. The Dizzy series sold over 5 million copies, mostly on Spectrum. The Spectrum created Britain's first gaming controversies. Soft and Cuddly's disturbing imagery and Jack the Ripper's violence sparked censorship debates that seem quaint today. The gaming Wild West period saw anything go, shaping discussions about content that continue today. By 1986, cracks showed in Sinclair's empire. The Spectrum looked dated against 16-bit machines like the Atari ST and Commodore Amiga. Warning signs had existed for years. Sinclair research operated on razor-thin margins, with Sir Clive funding other ventures from computer profits. The C5 electric vehicle's spectacular 1985 failure lost £7 million and made Sinclair a national joke photographed looking ridiculous in his tiny tricycle. Competition intensified everywhere. The Commodore 64's superior sound and sprites ate market share. Amstrad's CPC range offered similar prices with better keyboards and built-in tape decks. Even within Sinclair's ecosystem, confusion reigned. The Spectrum Plus competed with the incompatible 128K model. In April 1986, the unthinkable happened. Sinclair Research sold the Spectrum brand to Amstrad for £5 million. Sir Clive was out. Alan Sugar, who saw computers as consumer electronics like hi-fi systems, was in. The Amstrad years were profitable but soulless. The Plus 2 and Plus 3 were technically superior but lacked pioneering spirit. Computers designed by accountants, not visionaries. The Plus 3's obscure 3-inch disc format symbolised Amstrad's disconnect from the community. By 1990, commercial releases slowed to a trickle. The last official game, Dalek Attack, arrived in 1993 to an audience that had moved on. Yet the Spectrum refused to die. Eastern European clones like the Pentagon and Didactic kept the architecture alive into the 1990s. In Russia, commercial games were still released in 2004, 12 years after UK production ceased. The legacy is immense. Britain's £7 billion games industry was built on Spectrum foundations. Rockstar North, Grand Theft Auto, traces back to DMA Design's Spectrum developers. Rare started as Ultimate Play the Game. David Braben's Frontier development still makes elite games 40 years later. Spectrum-trained programmers became Britain's tech backbone. Making games work in 48K created engineers who could optimise anything. Loading games from tape taught debugging patience. Working around limitations fostered lasting innovation. Culturally, the Spectrum created shared language for millions, references to Jet Set Willy and a tribute clash bind generations together. The world of Spectrum Archive preserves virtually everything. The ZX Spectrum next raised £700,000 from nostalgic fans. Modern indie gaming's emphasis on gameplay over graphics is essentially bedroom coding philosophy vindicated. Most importantly, the Spectrum showed ordinary people could master computers, create with them, even make fortunes. It made Britain believe in competing digitally, transforming us from computer-curious observers into digital natives. The ZX Spectrum wasn't just a computer, it was a social equaliser that transformed Britain from computer-curious observers into digital natives. Sir Clive Sinclair's rubber-keyed revolution brought possibility to millions who would never have accessed it otherwise. Today, when we carry supercomputers in our pockets and complain if apps take three seconds to load, it's worth remembering those kids who waited 10 minutes for games to load from cassette, who typed thousands of lines from magazines, who learned programming because they could. If this brought back memories or taught you something new, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. And remember, it's not a bug, it's a feature.